give me a land where the bright diamond sand flows leisurely down to the stream, where the graceful white swan goes gliding along like a maid in a heavenly dream. How often at night, with the heavens so bright, with the light from the glittering stars, have I laid there amazed and asked as I gazed if their glory exceeds that of ours. Where the air is so pure and the zephyrs so free, the breezes so balmy and light, I would not exchange my home on the range for all of the cities so bright. Home, home on the range, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. Home, home on the range. Wow. That was John Lomax III, and welcome. I'm Becky Mayer. Welcome to Transitions, Body, Mind, Spirit. Transitions, we all have so many transitions in our life, and I like to use the metaphor of triathlons, some things that I do. Uh, as an example, first you, you swim, and then you get in a transition area, and then you bicycle, and then you do a transition again, and then you run. So that's a good metaphor of the, so many things that we've done in our lives and what we thought we set out to do and it changed and it changed. And John Lomax, welcome to our show. Well, thank you, Becky. It's wow. A, it's a thrill and a pleasure. I appreciate yes. it. Well, the neat thing is John comes from a, a family legacy of uh, John, John Lomax, your granddad. Mm -hmm. Say in a nutshell what he's famous for. Well, he's famous for a lot of things, but the most famous thing was that when he was a teenager, he started writing down the words to cowboy songs that he heard. This was in the mid-1880s, and the Chisholm Trail happened to run practically through their backyard. Hmm. So he started writing these words down because it fascinated him to hear the cowboys singing to soothe the herds at night, because mm. the last thing you want at night is restless cattle. Right. So he would lie there and hear these songs, and he started writing down the words. And 25 years after he started doing that, his first book came out called Cowboy Songs and Other Frontier Ballads. And in that book, for the first time, was the, he published a whole batch of cowboy songs that have gone on to be a part of our nation's history and a, mm. some of the most famous cowboy songs ever. And I'll sing a couple of those after, afterward. And I just started with one, Home on the Range, mm -hmm. which had been written in 1873, but it had never mm. been published in a book. It had gained all this popularity from word of mouth, mm. starting as a poem in a Kansas newspaper, and a neighbor put it to music. Wow. Wow. And so you're, and the, the next part of that is that your grandfather a ended up uh, recording songs all over the South, right? Well, he recorded all over the United States in the end, okay. but he did record primarily closer to where he was. And mm -hmm. uh, the 1933 and 34, he had advanced to where he was recording all manner of songs, not just cowboy songs. Mm -hmm. He would record in prisons, church services, wow. children's play games, people who had a personal narrative. If he thought they were interested and thought the American people wanted would like to have this, because he was recording for the Library of Congress. He was preserving all of this for, the Library for all of, of us. Congress, wow. <laughs> they were sponsoring the 1933 and 34 expedition, which led to the publication of American uh, folk songs and other ballads, American, American folk songs. <laughs> American ballads and folk songs is the name of that book in 1934. Ah, that he wrote. He and Alan, his younger son, who had left the University of Texas and joined him in 1933 when he was 18 years old. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they went off together in a Model A Ford with a tape recorder built into the trunk. It must have been a big tape recorder. 315 pounds worth 350 of, pounds. <laughs> it was a mobile recording studio, state of the art for 1933. Wow. The roads were terrible, of course, and but they made 10,000 miles on that year and a half collecting trip. And not wow. only did they find all of those songs, that was when they first recorded Lead Belly. Mm -hmm. who became one of the best known folk singers there is. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a, so the, the, the Lomax name, that's quite a legacy, and of course you're John Lomax the mm third, -hmm. and I want to concentrate on you and what you have been doing as, well, it's amazing, uh, in fact, let me give the audience just some idea uh, what John has done. He's written hundreds of articles for as a music journalist. He's an oral historian with the Country Music Foundation. These are all in, in the past. There were so many. I, it's, he wrote it down for me because I couldn't remember it all. Um, he's an author of uh, two really cool books here, The Red Desert Sky, John Lomax III, right here. And then we have the Nashville Music City USA right here also. But that's not all, folks. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's artist manager of Towns Van Zandt, a very, very uh, important country music folk artist. Steve Earle, the Cactus Brothers, America's dulcimer champion, David uh, Sh Schofer. Schnaufer. Schnaufer, right and also a winner of the CMA Joe Walker Meter International Achievement Award. He's been a mu music publisher, record label executive, album producer, um, and also uh, a, a Im importer, exporter, Export. Export. exporter of uh, <clears throat> records uh, worldwide. And we'll, we'll get to a really interesting story about that. But to have all this background, and I want to start out when he was a wee little boy in Texas. And you were in Houston? Houston. Houston, mm -hmm. Houston Texas. And growing up in this, all this, uh, the Lomax name and the, the grandfather did all this stuff and your dad was also a music person. Did you decide when you were a young boy, I want to be in music? No, I wanted to be a baseball star. You wanted to be a baseball <laughs> star. There you go. <laughs> and I worked hard at it. And starting at the age of nine and nine. played uh, organized baseball until I was 19. And at that point, I kind of realized I wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna make the grade. And the best that I could hope for would be low minor leagues. And that's not the kind of life that one wants if they're not if they think they have a chance, you know, they will go on. But I figured, you know, I didn't grow up. I wasn't really big. I wasn't really fast. Hmm. My eyesight wasn't the great greatest, so it was hard to hit as well oh. as, you know, even with glasses. So, so I gave up on that idea and uh, wound up a few years later after going to college and being a fraternity drunk. Uh, a fraternity drunk? <laughs> yeah. I thought you majored in beer drinking. I did, yes, yeah. indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Graduate work, indeed, as well. But you did get a degree in journalism? Uh, history. History. And went back uh, a few years later and picked up a master's in library science. Okay, all right. And was a librarian for a couple of years. Wow, but music had this pull on you. Yeah, I think it's just, it's what Lomaxes do, I think. Um, it just, uh, I started uh, about my second year of college, I thought, you know, I'm spending all my time that I'm not in class and doing homework, I'm going to music, I'm buying and listening to records, I'm hanging out with musicians, so <laughs> why don't I figure out a way that I could get in the game? Because my I had no talent as a uh, picker of any kind. Did you play no. the guitar? No, never <sighs> played guitar. Tried to play drums, but I was hearing drum, uh, guitar lines, but trying to play drums, which is not, you know, the right thing. 
and uh, I was bored with just keeping rhythm. And also, I didn't think I sang very well. I didn't think I had any talent at all. So I started writing about it. And I started getting a few articles published here and there. And then mm -hmm. uh, after college, I went to Houston and began uh, writing reviews for Space City News which was one of the early underground papers. You know, ah. we talk, call them alternative papers today, but yes. it was a free weekly with entertainment. And this particular one, there was a lot of politics because this was in the early 70s and the war and race issues and mm. all sorts of drugs and all kinds of things were going on. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did, uh, I appointed myself music editor pretty early on and nobody objected because it was a free job anyway. <laughs> All I got out of it was hustle records and uh, get concert tickets and even a stray t-shirt now and then yeah. or, or a satin jacket. That was the big deal Whoa. a little bit later, yeah. <laughs> but you didn't get any money. Wow, well, how are you making a living? Well, I was a librarian. Oh, uh, I worked okay. for Houston Public Library. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then uh, I decided that I just wasn't a librarian. It was too, uh, you know, you had to sit in one place all the time, you know. Yeah. And I was a reference. I loved the idea of being a reference librarian because you just, anybody could call you, walk in, or write you with a question. And you not only had to answer it, you had to give a source. So you couldn't just say the population of Cuba in 1912 was this. You had to say, well, in such and such a book, it says, and that would, of course, you would cite a, a like probably encyclopedia or something. Mm -hmm. But you'd be in one place all day long. And mm -hmm. uh, so I got lucky and got a chance to come up here and work in Nashville, and that was 50 years ago in June. 50 years ago, and you worked for the well-known, at the time, Jack Clement? Cowboy Jack Clement. Cowboy Jack, tell us about, he's legendary, and you worked for this guy. I worked for him, and he's uh, deservedly so a legend. I mean, he came out of Sun Records. He started Sun producing Records. at Sun Records, and mm -hmm. actually produced Roy Orbison and some records on him before mm. Roy Orbison moved here and worked with a different record company and had those hits that everyone is aware of. Mm. Uh, but Jack hung out with Johnny Cash, wrote a bunch of songs for Johnny Cash, Ballad of a Teenage Queen, Guess Things Happen That Way, and found himself in Nashville. And uh, he had a studio in Beaumont after he left Memphis, and then he came up to Nashville, mm -hmm. bringing uh, Alan Reynolds and Bob MacDill with him, uh, both of whom became great talents. And uh, Alan, as a producer and songwriter, Bob MacDill is one of the great country songwriters of the mm -hmm. last 50 years. Uh, but Jack had a way, uh, he wrote hits, he produced hits, he published hits. Wow. He had a record company that started Don Williams' career. He uh, ran kind of a salon out of his house where people would just drift in and out and sit mm -hmm. around and he would have a little metal office with a whole bunch of musical instruments on the walls and everyone would just sit around and pick and sing. And wow. He produced one uh, side of U2's Rattle and Hum album. He huh. produced Louis Armstrong, for goodness sake. Oh, wow. And that's a feather in his cap that no one could match in Nashville. God. So and you were in this, this juicy, creative, you know, uh, mix of learning from this guy, right? Well, learning, I was working in first in publicity and then in publishing and then for the record label for a little while. Wow. And then Don Williams went off to another label and the record company kind of kept going, but <laughs> going down rather than going up. So I thought at that time, by now we're in 1976 and I thought I needed to kind of ooze out the door because there wasn't any reason for him to keep paying me because, mm. you know, the label was done and the mm. uh, publicity company had kind of wound down. He was, he was doing publicity for Charlie Pride, Tom Paul and the Glazer Brothers, the Stonemans, 
Dickie Lee, Mac Wiseman, all of whom he produced. Mm. So he was a one-stop shop. He'd write hits, produce them, and then had them on their, his publicity company. Right. Right. <clears throat> and he'd also made a movie called Dear Dead Delilah that cost him hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, wow. So that was a good time to kind of ease out the door, and I did, and that's when I started managing Towns, Van Zant. That's when you started working with Towns Van Zant mm -hmm. as art, art. That was your first artist manager thing. He was my first victim. That's okay, right. Okay, victim. Yep. Well, he, I, how how'd that go? It went all right. Mm -hmm. um, it was before he had serious drug issues and okay. before he, a lifetime of alcohol had completely mm -hmm. set in. Right. So uh, this was just a couple of years, but during that period, we were able to get. Four, five of his early albums re-released on a new record label. Mm -hmm. He made a new album and the Live at the Old Quarter album that had been in the can for four years finally came out <laughs> and that today is still regarded as his masterpiece. Two, wow. two sides of Live in a Houston in a little tiny club called the Old Quarter. The old quarter in Houston. Yeah, about wow. a, a little bit larger than an average living room, mm -hmm. but not much. Wow. So let's fast forward. Okay, <laughs> you're Towns Van Zant's manager, mm -hmm. but uh, and so you are self-employed doing your thing, mm -hmm. and then in the meantime, if somebody needs something written, you're writing for maybe a country magazine. Yeah. Well, I started writing for Buddy magazine, Buddy. which was here in Nashville, and okay. it was modeled. I mean, it was <laughs> sorry. I wrote for Buddy. Hank magazine in Nashville was modeled on Buddy, oh. and a fellow named Harvey McGee asked me if I. I would write for them, and I, that was my first publisher in Nashville. Was was Hank Magazine? It was a little bitty tabloid, tiny mm -hmm. thing, but it came out uh, sporadically. But it covered a lot of ground, and was the first Emmy Lou Harris album. A uh, magazine cover was on Hank. Mm -hmm. They wrote about Guy Clark and Towns and all those kind of bubbling under off-the-wall artists that later became huge, but they mm -hmm. were the first ones to actually write features on them. Mm -hmm. So uh, that got me started uh, here writing. I was still sending stuff down to Texas to various magazines mm -hmm. that I had written for there. Mm -hmm. And then also, it wasn't just Towns Van Zant, but uh, uh, Steve Earle. A little bit he, later, Steve, I did about two and a half, three years working with him. Well known, and he also <laughs> had um, uh, well known uh, uh, addictions issues. Later on, uh -huh. uh, here again, I was there before things got really bad. I managed okay. him till 86, 83 to 86, and okay. a little bit afterward was when things kind of spiraled downhill. But he pulled himself up. I mean, he has yeah. done an amazing job. Yes. So the artist management part and, and going next in your career, what happened after that? Well, in 1980, <coughs> excuse me, I started a magazine called the Nashville Gazette, and it lasted for six months, but it also wow. got me writing a whole lot more. After Steve and I parted ways, uh, uh, I was kind of depressed. After Towns and I parted ways, I was real depressed. Uh, wow. And then I started the magazine. The magazine flopped, got depressed again, worked with Steve Earle. <laughs> then that went away. And got depressed yeah, again. <laughs> got depressed again. <laughs> swore I'd never manage again. But then one day this fellow named Drew Ponder rapped on my door on a Sunday morning and said, John, this is David Schnaufer. You guys need to know each other and turned around and walked off Whoa. and left this fellow on my doorstep who it turned out was the maestro of dulcimer the Appalachian dulcimer four yes. strings wow. and he could make it sound like a harpsichord a lyre a lyre a guitar just he was Amazing. phenomenal he was he wow. would play it with all his fingers and thumb but to be a, a, an artist manager makes money from uh, the artist and how much of a demand is there for a dulcimer player? Well, we created a fair amount. Uh, he went mm -hmm. on to do sessions for Kathy Matea, Johnny Cash, yeah. the Wagoneers, uh, the Judds. Uh, 
Wow. Uh, he taught Sandy Lauper to play guitar, uh, and dulcimer. All these things are, you're the man in back getting this guy out there. Right, right. right. And a lot of people, that's why I, I want to make sure people know that it's your skills and your reputation that gets people in the door to, to go up higher. Exactly. Yeah, right. I'm great at starting them out. I'm yeah, not so yeah, great at, <laughs> after that, but yeah, in the early going. Yeah, they're starting to go, see ya. <laughs> he, uh, we did two records, and I was mm -hmm. able to use the exact same studio and engineer that Garth Brooks did because we recorded ah. in that same studio that was owned by Alan Reynolds. Right. And I'd known Alan for years because I worked for Jack Clement, who was Alan's mentor. Right. So this is <laughs> uh, what I've learned from learning your life is that you have built from one connection to the next connection to other and it kept on building and the the neat story is that what you're still doing is s uh, em exporting records from America to places around the world correct right I started and that in 96 and because uh, I want to have time for you to do another song or two uh, tell us a story about Prince and Garth Brooks Particularly Garth Brooks, how when he started out, how you were involved with his his well, albums. Well, I started exporting in '96, and uh, it came about because I met a guy at a convention in France called Medem, which is mm -hmm. the biggest music business convention. And uh, I would always go to Medem and take records from people in Nashville and just give them out. Just say, here, here's have some of this and some of that. And so this guy walked up the next day and said, I want a hundred of those. And held up a record by a woman named Mary Ann OCL. So I went back to Nashville, found Mary Ann, bought a hundred, shipped them off to Italy, and that's how it started. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we built it up to where I had 32 accounts in Japan, Australia, and throughout Europe. Wow. And the idea was I would find records that the big distributors either didn't want to fool with mm -hmm. or couldn't find the artist or didn't want to mess with it. And the artist trying to ship records overseas is hopeless. It, There's miserable. a real art to it. So the Garth Brooks, what did so you do Garth, with Garth? Well, when I started doing it... Because we have just a little bit here and I want to have time for okay, uh, Garth, a song. Uh, Garth made a deal with Walmart to where they were the exclusive distributors of all of Garth Brooks You could only go to Walmart stuff. to get your Garth Brooks. That's, or Sam's, Sam's uh -huh. Club or Walmart. And so um, I figured out how to buy them from them direct rather than, uh, I was literally in the beginning just pulling them off the shelves and going up to the <laughs> register with a, ca a cart full of Garth. And, and so then we eventually worked out how I was able to order them through a different boys and this and that and the other. But long story short, before the deal was done, Garth had sold, uh, had 13 different titles. And some of those titles were multi CD or multi DVD packages. Mm -hmm. And we round up selling 98,000 pieces on Garth. 98,000? All that's an, overseas. That is amazing. 98,000. And some of those were six CD sets, and, but we just mm -hmm. counted them as one. Wow. So. Well, I want to fast forward in that the fact that streaming has really taken a toll on no. your business. Hate it. And uh, sending <laughs> out actual physical albums but the neat thing is you have this new career and I just saw you starring at the Country Music Hall of Fame and you are giving talks and singing about your family background and uh, about these amazing songs that might have gotten lost had your grandfather not found them and it's so entertaining and you're going to be at the Green Hills Library and February 19th that's right February 19th and and you are available uh, for other uh, other venues I just put that out there and then we're going to show that you do have a um, uh, a website if you want to know more. No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting one. <laughs> uh, soon we'll have a website yeah, soon will. if you want to know more information. So uh, with that note, I'd like you to do another song for us. Okay, great. Last night as I lay on the prairie 
and looked up at the stars in the sky. I wondered if ever a cowboy could drift to that sweet by and by. Ah, the road to that bright, happy region is a dim, narrow trail, so they say. But the broad one that leads to perdition is posted and blazed all the way. Roll on, roll on, roll on, little doggies, roll on, roll on, roll on, roll on, roll on, little doggies, roll on. They say he will never forget you. He knows every action and look. So for safety's sake, better get branded. Get your name in his big tally book. For they tell there will be a great roundup. And cowboys like doggies will stand to be cut by the riders of judgment who are posted and know every brand. For they tell of another great owner who's never or stocked, so they say. He always makes room for the sinner who drifts from the straight, narrow way. Roll on, roll on, roll on, little doggies, roll on, roll on, roll on, roll on, roll on, little doggies, roll on. That was wonderful, John Lomax the third. The cowboy's dream. The cowboy's dream. <laughs> Wow, and there's so many other songs that uh, that are out there. Uh, what are name just a couple songs that you sang at uh, the Hall of Fame? Whoopie tie ya yo, get along little doggies. Yeah. That's one. Uh, Sloop John B, because my uncle was the first person to record that song in 1935. Oh. That wow. would be 31 years before the Beach Boys had a big hit with it. Wow. Uh, MTA, which my aunt co-wrote for a Boston election in 1941, and that became a big hit for the Kingston Trio. Uh, wow. The Virgin Sturgeon is one of my favorites to sing, <laughs> which is a little <laughs> naughty, but fun. <laughs> and uh, oh golly, there's so many uh, lead belly songs like Rock Island Line, Good Night Irene, Midnight Special, wow. we sing those. Uh, wow. Well, John Lomax, thank you so much for being on Transitions, and who knows, we may have to have you back because there's more songs to sing. Plenty more. Yes. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Transitions. All right. All right. Yay! Yay! Good.